I tell players that those reps that you leave lying on the floor or in the rack are the ones that make you stronger. If, if I'm supposed to do a set of five and I do that set of five and all five of those reps were easy, then I'm not getting stronger. You've got to, you know, the only way to get stronger is to lift heavy weights. And that's the only way to get faster is to sprint. There is no other magic pill, potion, or program mm -hmm. that can substitute for that. And that's the basis of what we do. And so, and that's all mental. That's not mm -hmm. physical. That is mental. Me making my mind up before I even pick the weight up, whether or not I'm going to be able to do it for a set of three, four, five, six reps. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the process that we're working on here with the Aggies. Hey, Texas high school football fans. It's Taylor Aaron, sideline reporter for TexasHSFootball.com and the host of the Texas HS Football Podcast. Y'all, we know that in football, speed is essential. And that's one of the most important things college coaches and recruiters look for. They see your 40 time posted on your social media profiles, but here's the problem. They don't trust the times they see. Did you know the average 40 time is off by 0 0.28 seconds? That is where our Texas HS football podcast sponsor comes in. Laser Combines knows that timing is everything. They use the same official timing equipment of the NFL Combine. Laser Combines offers timing that NFL and college coaches trust. So when every tenth of a second counts, trust Laser Combines. Get timed, get recruited, check out lasercombines.com. Welcome to the Texas HS Football Podcast. I'm excited for this one today. He is a guest I really wanted on the podcast because of his expertise. So I was very grateful he said yes. And our chat was so good, even better than I expected. You will enjoy getting to learn from the best in the business. His name is Tommy Moffat, Texas A&M strength and conditioning coach. And he's a great guy with lots of advice for not just football athletes, but all athletes. Uh, so the morning's going well. Um, just finished with our staff meeting, and now we have multiple tasks to take care of this morning uh, before the players come in to train. But all is going well in College Station. That's fantastic. Do your players lift in the morning, afternoon? Uh, so uh, we lift in the afternoon. So today um, we have a team meeting. Mm -hmm. And after that, the defense will come in here and lift while the offensive staff and position players meet, and then they flip-flop. And then after that, we'll go to a team meeting. So right now, all of our lifting meetings and football work is done in the afternoon. Okay, that's good. It gives them time to kind of wake up in the morning. Go to <laughs> get, class. Yeah, go to class. Go to class. <laughs> right. <laughs> get the schoolwork done and then focus on on the football. <laughs> that's great. Well, mm -hmm. I appreciate you giving me your time today. I know you have a crazy <laughs> busy schedule. And I wanted a strength and conditioning coach on here on the podcast. And I recently saw you on um, Tech Sags and you were saying that you, you just getting that position, you um, you liked Coach Elko, so you put out the feelers and you got yeah. the position. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to ask him. So uh, yeah. we made it happen and I'm, it worked out for both of us. So I'm grateful you're here. But before we dig into everything, can you just give a recap of your 30 plus years of coaching experience? Yes, I can. So uh, I began my coaching career as a student and grad assistant at Tennessee Tech University where I played. Uh, I did that for a year and I needed money. Um, so I left uh, the university after, you know, a year of grad school and started looking for a job and uh, finally got a job at a non-denominational Christian school in New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, called John Curtis Christian School. So I coached at John Curtis for six years. Uh, after those six years, I moved to the University of Tennessee, uh, where I was the associate director of strength and conditioning for the football team, 
but I was also in charge of tracking track and field, uh, which was uh, which was a lot of fun. Also, um, after four years at the University of Tennessee, it was from 1994 until 1998. I left there to go to the University of Miami to work for Coach Butch Davis. Um, I was only there for two years. Uh, but while I was at Miami, I, I was uh, the head string coach for the football team. I worked with uh, crew, men's and women's swimming and diving, and men's and women's track and field. So I was busy, busy, busy there. Mm -hmm. um, and then when Coach Saban got the job at LSU, uh, he called me and offered uh, me that job. And so I left Miami to go to LSU where I spent the next uh, 22 football seasons as director of strength and conditioning for the entire athletic department and football. Mm -hmm. And so when Coach Kelly got the job um, two years ago, he let me and another 60 some odd people go. So I took two years off, had my own podcast, and mm -hmm. started a um, a remote coaching uh, app called The Moffitt Method, and did that for two years. And then when this job opened up here is uh, when I jumped back in and um, did everything I could to, to, to get this job here at Texas A&M. So here I am. That's so awesome. I love how diverse your background is. You've been pretty much everywhere and have your mm -hmm. little tidbits of experience everywhere. And I love that you were able to branch off on your own for a little bit. How is that transition going off on your own after being in the industry? Uh, for so long? It, yeah, it was, uh, it's been very rewarding being mm -hmm. able to help uh, small colleges, JUCOs, uh, and high school and junior high school programs. So that that that's been very rewarding that we are able to pass a lot of the experiences uh, and programming tips and ideals and stuff that you know that I used myself for you know over thirty years, uh, pass it down and then remotely organize and train training programs for all sports, uh, athletic departments, uh, entire school boards. Uh, so that has been very rewarding. And I did a lot of traveling then and, you know, went around and talked to ADs and uh, school board presidents and um, school board athletic directors and stuff. So that I learned a lot about uh, business and uh, high school sports because I'd been out of you know the high school ram and I found out that there are a lot of really good programs today in high school. Um, not everyone is training like they should, uh, but there are a lot of really good coaches um, that are coaching in high school sports. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was good, and we still have the company. I have other people that are running the business for me now because I'm devoted, you know, full time to this opportunity here and trying to make the best of it. And when I, when I finally get my feet firmly planted on the ground, uh, because we had a podcast that I hosted, I think I hosted like 55 episodes of a podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, and once I get my feet planted here, I'm going to start, start doing the podcast. I probably won't do the hour, two hour length uh -huh. that I was, but I will, um, start doing the podcast again at some point. That yeah, I, I agree with that. Like a podcast is a lot of work. <laughs> so yeah. once you get yeah, your is. routine going and then it's just, it's fun to do. It's kind of like a side job mm -hmm. and it, it doesn't take much time, but it does take time to put it like to get the yeah. interviews together and everything. So I can relate to you on that level. And I love that you brought up the high school football because that's why I wanted you on here, strength and conditioning mm -hmm. coach on the podcast, because during the off season, it, the belief is what happens in the off season has a huge effect on the success in the season. Does any of that ring true? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, part of my responsibility, the primary part of my responsibility is, you know, strength, speed, and work capacity, uh, which I take very seriously. But there's also a mental aspect of that. Um, and whether you call it mental toughness or mental resiliency, uh, there's a lot that goes into developing, you know, the culture and the attitude of the football team. 
um, and their ability, the player's ability to overcome adversity. And uh, that's an important part of it that goes beyond the strength and conditioning aspect of it and something that we take very serious here and mm -hmm. something that Coach Elko takes very serious um, and a major part of my responsibility. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with that. And I instantly connect with that because I feel our mind is our strongest muscle. And sometimes mm -hmm. our body knows what to do, but it's our minds we got to convince. Yeah. So what would you say are the best ways to build confidence and mental strength? Yeah. So first of all, it has to do with the attitude that you have about the work that you're about to begin. And um, uh, I call it self-limiting behavior. So for instance, if, if I sit around all morning long and I, and I think to myself, oh, we have heavy squats today. Those squats are going to be heavy squats, make my knee sore squats hurt my neck when I squat. If I just sit around and think about having to do heavy squats today, regardless of the amount of weight on the bar, it's going to be heavy. And I tell people all the time, you have to be careful what you say to yourself because sooner or later you'll start believing it. And then the other aspect of it is, you know, um, giving up mentally before I'm ever physically challenged. Mm -hmm. And I witnessed this Friday, we were working out and, you know, we were doing an auxiliary lift and I, and I was talking to a group of players and I heard some weights drop next to me that sounded real heavy. So I wanted to see who was training and, you know, who was doing that, that rep. And I looked over and I saw one of it's one of our best players. He's over there working his butt off. And when he finished, he set the weight down. It went boom. Mm -hmm. And then um, another player, his workout partner at the same position, mm -hmm. walked over there and started taking weights off before it was his turn to go. Mm -hmm. So I stopped what I was doing. I went over there. I said, why are you taking that weight off? He said, coach, it's heavy. I said, how do you know it's heavy if you haven't picked it up? And so I said, put it back on there, put the weight back on there and try. And he puts the weight on and he just starts repping it out like it was nothing. And I was like, what are you doing? Um, you know, that there was nothing wrong with the weight that was already on the bar. And he goes, coach, I, I didn't think I could do it. Mm -hmm. And so I tell players that those reps that you leave lying on the floor or in the rack, are the ones that make you stronger. If mm -hmm. if I'm supposed to do a set of five and I do that set of five and all five of those reps were easy, then I'm not getting stronger. Mm -hmm. You've got to, you know, and the only way to get stronger is to lift heavy weights. And that's the only way to get faster is to sprint. There mm -hmm. is no other magic pill, potion, or program mm -hmm. that can substitute for that. And that's the basis of what we do. And so, and that's all mental. That's not physical. That is mental. Me making my mind up before I even pick the weight up, whether or not I'm going to be able to do it for a set of three, four, five, six reps. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the process that we're working on here with the Aggies. Right. Everyone wants a magic pill in society, but it's just yeah, that simple. Not, there's, <laughs> yeah, there's no easy way. And everybody at this level is really, really, really good. Right. Uh, every, every SEC football program has a strength coach and, and I know 90% of those guys and I know every day they go to work, they're doing everything they can to give their team an opportunity to win. And our players, any player, has to decide every day they go in the gym who are they going to outwork and who may be outworking them and what are you going to do to set yourself apart from all those other people and that's something that we're working on uh here every moment of every day and every second counts right every oh, second absolutely. of our preparation counts there's no days off Mm -hmm. No days off. It's always on. And like you said, there's a lot of great athletes and you got to stand out above the rest. Like what makes you special yes. and what action should high school football athletes be incorporating in the weight room now, if they want to have the opportunity to play at the college level? Yeah. Well, so, and this is what we preach with the Moffitt method. And that mm -hmm. is 
and and with the Texas A&M Aggies, technique is paramount. So mm -hmm. there is nothing that we do in the weight room or outside on the track that is more important than f the execution of the movement, and it has to be flawless. Mm -hmm. um, if if I'm doing any exercise, bench press or squats or power cleans or deadlifts, if my technique is incorrect, not only am I at risk of getting hurt, but I'm not going to be able to lift as much weight. Mm -hmm. So by working harder, by taking the time to perfect my technique, not only will I stay healthy, but I will also be able to train with more weight. And the more reps that I do at a heavier weight, the better I get. So number one is focus on how you perform the exercises um, and then make sure that you go in there every day with the mindset that you're going to outwork everybody on your team or everybody on your roster. And this, we show our player, our recruits, a chart. Uh, it's called the Kettle Index. And the chart depicts the amount of height and the amount of weight that a player gains between the age of 13 and 18 years old. And that, that growth is exponential. Right. And um, once a, an athlete, male or female, reaches mm -hmm. the age of 18, that growth starts to slow down. So it is important that athletes, all athletes, not just football players, but mm -hmm. all athletes begin training you know, at or before the age of 13 to develop flawless technique. Um, and then so once that growth spurt starts to occur at around age 13, mm -hmm. they need to be training daily, year round and playing multiple sports to take advantage of that growth. Because mm -hmm. once they get to Texas A&M, they don't have nearly as much room for growth as they did in their formative years. Mm -hmm. So it's important that they take advantage of that growth spurt, train regularly, do something at least five days a week. Um, uh, and you can't max out every day. You can't sprint full speed every day. You can't practice with full contact every day, but there is something that young men and women can do five days out of the week mm -hmm. uh, that's going to help them be better. And so stay busy. So have great techniques, stay busy, train, sprint, run, practice your sports skills, plyometrics, agility drills. There's just so much to it mm -hmm. uh, for young men and women to do. But unfortunately, you know, they don't, either they don't value it or they don't see the importance of it uh, or they think that when they get to college, they're going to do this. Mm -hmm. But the room for improvement once they get here is really realistically anywhere from 15 to 20 percent, which is still a big number. But if I'm a football player and I enroll as a freshman <laughs> And, my, and I can clean 300 pounds, I can bench close to 400 pounds, and I'm squatting at or above 500 pounds, and I increase those numbers by 20%, they're in an elite category of collegiate football players. But if I'm a high school, if I'm a, a high school senior, and my clean max is 185, my bench match max is 225 and I'm barely squatting over 300 pounds. Then when I get to college, if I'm only able to add 20% to those numbers, they're not even close to right. where uh, an SEC level player is. Um, and so it's important that they train, they train often, they train with great technique mm -hmm. Um and they, you know, they eat well. So, and I tell our players and every recruit that comes in here, there's, again, there's no magic pill potion or program that can out train bad diets and poor sleep habits. And research has shown that 65% of all of the soft tissue injuries 
that athletes receive can be attributed to poor sleep. Mm -hmm. That same research showed that when I increase the amount of sleep that I get from seven to eight hours a night, mm -hmm. I reduce my chances of a soft tissue injury by 30%. Mm -hmm. So when you couple a great speed strength and conditioning program with proper rest, mm -hmm. you're going to and sleep seven at a minimum of seven, mm -hmm. uh, ideally eight hours a night, which is hard with homework and stuff mm -hmm. like that. You're going to reduce the chances of injury. And then when you throw in three really good meals per day, and you know that your athletes that they're eating, they're getting up and eating breakfast. And if they're not eating breakfast, there needs to be something available for them to at school to eat. Then they're eating lunch and then they're getting a snack in the afternoon after training or before football practice mm -hmm. so that they're going to have the energy uh the energy reserves and hydration required to make it through an intense football program mm -hmm. or practice or training session. And then they have to go home at night and eat real food. Chicken nuggets and a hamburger isn't real food. Mm -hmm. um, so I can summarize that mm -hmm. and say that they've got to train five days a week. They've got to sleep eight hours a night and they've got to eat three meals a day and make sure that they're hydrating well. If they do that, then they'll be, they'll put themselves in position to be within that elite category. If not, then they're going to be, you know, sitting around like a lot of college players do on draft day, wishing and hoping that they had done more. Right. There's so many things that you've touched on that are so good, especially the years they are in right now, this is like the peak moment where they really should capitalize on these good habits and learn. So like you said, they'll go into college already at this level above, and then they're just going to go that much higher and have the potential right. to grow and consistency there. You can't outwork a bad diet. That's another thing that I found so interesting because a lot of people are like, I'm working out every day, but I'm not seeing results. It's like, what are you putting into your body and how are you sleeping too? That's another yeah. great thing. So there's so many things that go into it that make a great athlete. And these are the habits that they need to start learning now so they can incorporate it. And it'll be like their daily nature because they've been doing it since at a young age and honing in more on the healthy aspect and the heat, especially in Texas, it gets so hot in the summer and hydration is so important. So in preparing your body to play for four quarters in the Texas heat. So what advice do you give to parents and athletes on how to prepare and how to hydrate well? Yeah. So, um, I'll start by saying 16 ounces of Powerade or Gatorade right before practice isn't enough. And it takes days uh, to properly hydrate. And it's something there are no days off when it comes to nutrition and hydration mm -hmm. um, and um, salting your food goes a long way. Uh, for young men and young women, both, mm -hmm. especially if they're, you know, outside preparation. Uh, it's a little different if you're indoors in the air conditioned building, playing basketball or volleyball. But if you're, if you're in, and they have to hydrate also, but um, uh, that the issue is exasperated when you're going outside and you're practicing, you know, an hour and a half to two and a half hours uh, in the hottest part of the days and you're training in the summertime, uh, you have to hydrate six, seven days a week. There are no days off. Uh, you have to make sure that in addition to water, you're getting your electrolytes, uh, which are very important. That's why salt in your food mm -hmm. uh, is important. Putting a little extra salt on your food. Salt isn't nearly as uh, sh or should not be nearly as demonized as it is of being, you know, an issue for people's heart and stuff. When you're a young athlete or an older athlete mm -hmm. who is competing and, and practicing outdoors in the heat or, you know, playing tennis and playing golf and all these other activities where you sweat, mm -hmm. you need to make sure that you're consuming um, electrolytes, sodium being the most important of all of those. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and you can do it without the sugary drinks like water and Powerade. Um, mm-hmm. The majority of those drinks are made for the consumer uh, because when you consume the correct amount of electrolytes mm-hmm. um, in a drink, it's not that flavorful. And uh, so what the manufacturers of those products do, they put a bunch of sugar in it so you can't taste the sodium. But Gatorade has a great product. Uh, Gator Lights uh, comes in a little small pack. Mm-hmm. And that's the one that I use. And everyone's like, God, Lee Coach, how do you, how, how do you stand to drink that? Mm-hmm. But it's got the sodium in it that is required uh, mm-hmm. to prevent cramping. Uh, there's also My High, mm-hmm. which is a very, very, which I like um, for people who don't like the taste of just raw electrolytes. My High is a very good product. It's... Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you can buy it in several different ways. You can order it online. I think it's a great product, whether you're a plant worker or a high school football player or a prof- In fact, it was designed by uh, a former professional football player who had cramping issues while he was in the NFL. Uh, but it's got a lot of sodium in it. It's got all the other electrolytes that are required. And it's also very tasty. And it comes in a pack where you just unscrew the bottle and drop it in there and shake it up. And it tastes good enough that people will consume uh, the recommended dosage without worrying about how bad it tastes. But if a, uh, if a electrolyte drink tastes good, that means it doesn't have nearly as much of the electrolytes mm-hmm. that it requires and it's filled with sugar because a good electrolyte product does not taste good. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you got to consume that and you got to consume water, um, you know, and you can't wait, you know, until you're dehydrated to start hydrating. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're thirsty, then that means that you haven't drank enough. So you should, you know, consume uh, several ounces every 10 minutes throughout the entire activity. And it's different for everyone and their level of hydration going into the contest. But, you know, every 10 minutes at a minimum, you should be hydrating constantly throughout the entire mm-hmm. practice or competition. So it's critical. Mm-hmm. And it, the engine doesn't run without proper hydration. It's like draining all the antifreeze out of your automobile and racing it across town. It's not mm-hmm. going to work. So you got to make sure you hydrate. Critical, 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 critical. And it starts again. It starts days in advance, yeah. not five minutes before the competition. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's funny you say that because I was just reading something that if you're low on energy and you're always feeling tired, it's probably because you are not hydrated. So right. all of this, I'm taking notes for myself because I do a lot of hot yoga too. So I'm always oh, yeah. needing to refuel all the water that's coming out of my body. And yeah. it's great that you are, like said, like the sugary drinks and they're going to probably not taste good if they're going to be right. beneficial. It's kind of like eating your greens <laughs> with right. the kids. sees a plate of greens. They're not probably going to want to eat it, but they're going to need those greens. <laughs> that's right. I think. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And I've been taking these salt chews recently. I think they've been helping, but I've been trying to stay mm-hmm. on top of it before it gets too late. Like you said, you have to start days in advance and just not wait until you're like, well, I'm dehydrated. I'm trying to play catch up. So that's great advice. And now I want to touch on um, longevity. Does strength and conditioning contribute to longevity of playing and and being able to do it for longer? Uh, absolutely. Um, and it's something like, for instance, Andrew Whitworth, uh, was a young man that I coached, um, while I was at LSU, he played professional football until he was, uh, 40, I think 40 years old, played left tackle, uh, one of the toughest positions in yeah. all of football to play. He played it until he was 40 years old. Uh, he was, you know, six, six and a half, six, seven, 320 pounds. And, um, uh, his waistline was, 
you know, never more than 38 inches at over 300 pounds. Um, just as fit as he could possibly be. Uh, Corey Webster was another guy that, that had a lengthy NFL career and, you know, he, and I, I never kept count, but he told me the year he retired, he said, coach, I've trained with you for 13 years. And I was like, what? He was, yeah, I trained with you five years of college and then my entire NFL career. Mm. So we spent 13 years training and mm. the training, um, the training for a professional athlete or, and, and, you know, when you said longevity, uh, you know, I immediately think about a professional athlete. So mm -hmm. when athletes begin training at a very young age, their training should be very basic, very fundamental, mm -hmm. focus on the large muscle groups and developing upper and lower body and thoracic uh, core strength and without any form of early specialization that they need general strength, uh, general strength trains a lot of muscle groups at once, like the barbell squat mm -hmm. or the bench press or the power clean or the barbell press, chin ups, push ups, dips, all of those exercises they're they're They do not focus on a single muscle group or a specific athletic skill movement. They're very general in nature. And then as an athlete, uh, and so in saying that, one of the mistakes that I think young coaches or co people who coach young athletes, they see what a guy like Andrew Whitworth is doing or, or uh, Mike Evans or, you know, some great Tiger Woods, for instance, they see what they do in their professional career, but they don't see the hours that those young men and young women spent doing the basic exercises and becoming proficient at performing squats, bench presses, barbell presses, chin-ups, and power cleans, for example. Mm -hmm. Then when a player reaches an elite level, now their training becomes very uh, position specific and you develop what is called special strength and it's the strength to perform that exercise that particular skill uh, proficiently and with great speed and power but then as those athletes begin to age and get more experience then their special strengths become um uh, become very high but then so then their training starts to become more generalized now to maintain that special strength throughout the rest of their career and that's the way Andrew Whitworth uh, and I'll give you another example Kyle Williams uh, who played for us at LSU who played 13 years in the NFL mm -hmm. his program was very basic and fundamental when he got to the league it got more specific mm -hmm. uh, and where he developed that special strength to play on the defensive line but then the latter stages of his career he went back to more fundamental exercises because he saw that his squat was no longer what it was. So he began to do his squats more often. Uh, and I saw Kyle at a football clinic last year before or this past fall or winter before I started here. And he was talking about how even still today after he's retired, mm -hmm. he still goes in the gym. The first exercise he does it are power snatches from the floor. Mm -hmm. And he says, I know as long as I do those exercises, I'm going to continue to maintain uh, the strength that I need to throw a deer in the back of the truck or, you know, pick my kids up and throw them across the room on the bed, right. play football in the front yard. But he said, when I stop doing those athletic movements mm -hmm. in the weight room, I start to feel old. So, yes. So now to answer your question, mm -hmm. it's been proven with, you know, on peer reviewed papers, 
white papers that the more you train with weights and develop your general strength before focusing on the specific, you know, sport and position specific strength, mm -hmm. you build a base that will last much longer. In fact, not many people know this guy, but his name is Laird Hamilton, and mm -hmm. he's not a football player. Laird Hamilton is the greatest surfer of all time. He won like six or seven world championships, uh -huh. you know, surfing those big 30, 40, 50 foot waves. But in, to do that, you have to be very strong and powerful to do that. And he wrote a book on training. And he said that your most elite athletes' engines are developed when they're young. And that holds true. The, the more work that you spend in the weight room and outside on the track sprinting and jumping, the, the bigger your engine is going to be and the longer that engine is going to last. And when you do, pray tell, that you get hurt, you're going to recover. It's a lot easier to rehab someone who's physically strong mm -hmm. than it is someone who's physically weak. Right. And um, trust me, I've I've rehabbed a lot of people, mm -hmm. and the stronger that a that a player or any athlete is prior to getting injured, because injuries happen. When right. you go to war, there's going to be casualties, yeah. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But the stronger you are prior to that injury and surgery, the easier and the faster you, your rehab is going to be. And it takes months longer to rehab a weak athlete than it does a strong athlete. Mm -hmm. It adds a month or more to that rehab process than it does someone that's physically strong. Right. I totally believe that. And I really love the going back to the fundamentals. I feel like social media nowadays, it's easy for a high school football athlete to, to get all caught up and want to do all fancy things, but you can always yeah. fall back on the basics. It's about yeah. your technique. I always say you can't build a house from the roof down. You got to start from the ground up. You got to have a strong right. foundation for anything and to have that longevity and um, reduces injuries. And it's just overall in general, just falling back on the basics. You can never go wrong. And it'll take you not only in football, but everyday life activities, which is great. And yeah. we talked about the off season training. Can you tell us the biggest difference between the off season training and in season training? Yes. Yeah, so great question. So uh, the biggest difference is the load, the overall load that a player, um, that a player has um, that determines what we do. So for instance, and in, um, in the weight room here, uh, well, let me let me back up by saying this. So we track everything that our players do. Uh, we track the barbell. Every time our players come to the weight room, they jump on a force plate at least one time a week, if not two. We do Nordboard testing, which tests their hamstring strength. Um, and then every time they go outside on the football field, whether it is to run, condition, or practice, they have a GPS monitor. So every time a Texas A&M football player wiggles, we track it. So when we're doing power cleans or snatches or split jerks, very dynamic, very explosive exercises, our best players move it anywhere from two point, and this would be their peak velocity. Mm -hmm. They move it anywhere from 2.3 to 3.5 meters per second, okay? Mm -hmm. We track that with a device, it's called Perch. It's a velocity-based tracking system that tracks the barbell. So they're moving that bar 2.3 to 3.5, somewhere in that area, meters per second. So when they're outside on the football field, practicing football field, we track that as well. And we'll have wide receivers, defensive backs, and some defensive linemen who will accelerate at those same velocities as many as 90 times in a practice. 
So that means that those players are doing 90 reps mm -hmm. of snatch, cleans, or jerks mm -hmm. at practice. Uh, we tallied it up for one particular player. And when you look at the high intensity accelerations throughout the entire week of practice, one player had over 400 reps at practice. So I know that we don't have to do that in the weight room mm -hmm. as often in season as we do off season because of all the work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. Now, there's research and everything that we do is evidence-based and there's research. Uh, the number one thing that you have, the, the thing that lasts the shortest amount of time in athletics is your speed. So speed diminishes quicker than any other thing in athletics. So we know that our players must sprint. Uh, and you have a window of about seven or eight days, plus or minus a few days, mm -hmm. to sprint at or near your maximum sprint speed, or you begin to lose it. Mm -hmm. So number one, as a strength coach, we have to make sure that our players are sprinting mm -hmm. at practice. Mm -hmm. And so then... We also know that endurance lasts longer than any other quality. Yep. So we know as strength and conditioning coaches, we have to do things that uh, uh, create opportunities at practice or outside of practice if our guys aren't sprinting fast enough for them to sprint. And then the next thing we know is we don't have to condition them as long as they're in shape when the season starts and we're fulfilling that demand during practice. We don't have to condition them nearly as much because conditioning, you only have to uh, tax yourself about once in every 20 to 30 days, plus or minus, it's different for every individual in order to maintain your conditioning. Now, to increase your speed and increase your conditioning, we know that we have to do that more often. But if you start the season and your team is in shape, then what you need to do is make sure that you continue to practice hard to fill that bucket and then sprint them whenever you get that uh, in practice, because it's better that they sprint in whether it's kickoff or, or punt or right. running routes or defending routes or running back, carrying the ball a little extra distance. Mm -hmm. And then you don't have to do that, but two or three times per week to maintain that sprint speed. Now, then the next thing that diminishes the quickest is strength endurance. Mm -hmm. So then we have to prescribe and that window I think is around 12 to 15 days. So we're going to do strength endurance more often than we're going to do maximum strength because maximum strength lasts a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be doing sets of three to five reps in the weight room more often than we're doing one to two reps mm -hmm. because strength endurance diminishes first and then as you start to lose that then your maximum strength so we're really only training for strength per se mm -hmm. you know once every two weeks but we're training for strength endurance every time our players come in the weight room Mm -hmm. Is that, did I answer your question? Yes. No, that you did answer my question. It makes sense because they're playing these long games. They've already built the strength and endurance. That's what right. they need right now to maintain and be able to, to, to fly through these games and be able to stay right. strong. And I think that's so interesting about the sprints. I did not know that. That's yeah, so cool. Speed, speed of movement is the first thing that you lose as an athlete sprints, right. your sprint speed. Mm -hmm. and, and so that window really is two to eight days. Mm -hmm. So they say three to five days, plus or minus two to three days. So you're mm -hmm. looking at two days to 10 days or eight days where you have to, 
a guy has to open up and run mm -hmm. to maintain. So if a guy runs 20.1 miles per hour, right. then he is going to have to hit somewhere within 21 to 22 miles an hour mm -hmm. to maintain that speed. In fact, I have a report. Right. So that is something that we look at. I've got to get, let me see if I have a report. Um, I know I do, but it's in my book here. Um, we track that every day. Mm -hmm. So we have guys that PR. So this week alone, uh, well, Saturday in Saturday's practice, we had three guys who hit 100% of their max velo. We had another player hit 103%. So he actually PR'd his speed in full pads uh, based on a speed that he had already, or he had already set a record in shorts and t-shirt. Mm -hmm. So by training this way, he broke his speed record Mm -hmm. by 3% in full pads based on a speed that he had already set this winter in shorts and t-shirt. Oh. Um, but I don't, I'm, I'll have to dig through because I carry a lot of papers. with me. I love uh, that you track everything. Yes. That's good track. for the athletes to see too, to see where yes. they start so and where they everything. need to go. We give, we give them speed tickets when they <laughs> break their speed. So we had, uh, so all of this, this green here, uh -huh. uh, you can see it. Oh green. yeah. All of that green is guys that set, um, or within 95 to a hundred percent of their maximum velocity. And so we had, uh, one Saturday, one, two, we had a guy at 99. So from 99 and above, we got one, two three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Here's a guy at 101%. So really 11. So we had 11 guys, 99% or above on Saturday. Wow. Um, and then really the, the only group that doesn't do that mm -hmm. uh, is the offensive lineman. Mm -hmm. And so I have a friend that did a study, uh, that a lot of our stuff is our practice is, and our, our sprint philosophy is built on, they track, he trained and they tracked the collegiate football team for an entire season. Right. And once, I mean, for an entire all season, so for mm -hmm. 12 months, they tr tracked their team. They employed this type of training. And so from uh, from the first day of training camp until the bowl game, 40% of their team PR'd in maximum sprint speed. Mm -hmm. uh, now, none of their offensive or defensive linemen PR'd. Because in the nature of their game is in such a small box, you know, right. uh -huh. so they don't have as many opportunities to express that max velo, but because of the extra that they did with those guys and all they wanted them to do is one time a week, sprint full speed, one right. time a week, one time a week. <laughs> and so they had 40% of their team that PR'd. And then they're not a single offensive or defensive lineman got slower. Although they did not PR, mm -hmm. their speed didn't drop. And the way we track it, if a guy hits that velo in a pursuit drill or a kickoff drill or mm -hmm. catching a route or breaking a running back, breaking and sprinting, whether they do it like that, Right. Or we manufacture it during or after practice and just pull them off to the side and say, hey, run from here to the far hash as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. We only want them to do it one time. Mm -hmm. And so that's all the extra effort it takes mm -hmm. to increase your speed or mm -hmm. not lose your speed mm -hmm. throughout the 
you know, four or five months of a, of a season. Mm -hmm. Yes. This has been so good. And like a lot of people just see the results, like, and they don't see the work behind the scenes and just doing one more rep, just one more one can rep. take you so much one further in life. Yeah, yeah, one is. rep will do it. <laughs> well, this has been so great. I appreciate your time. And before I let you go, can you just tell us a fun fact about you? I do this at the end of my podcast that we, we didn't get to learn about you. <laughs> uh, fun fact about me. Um, I love ice cream. Um, I love hunting and fishing. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. And do you like a particular uh, ice cream flavor? Yeah, Andy's Andy's uh, chocolate custard. Yep. Um, Yum. <laughs> and I didn't know this, but Andy's is a Texas company. I did not know that. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. But I love Andy's frozen custard. Um, and I love hunting and fishing. I uh, love it. And um, I guess that's about yep. it. Yep. Is that how you decompress hunting and fishing? Yes, hunting yep. and fishing. Yep. That's great because your life is all football. It's nice to have time for you too. Yeah. <laughs> well, I really appreciate your time and enjoyed getting to know you and all you. your advice that you have given. And I'm from an Aggie family, so I'll be cheering y'all on this season. Gig and we're season ticket holders, so I can't wait Good. to see what y'all do. <laughs> Good. Gigum, thank you very Gig much, em. Taylor. Thanks for having me on. Hello, Texas high school football fans. This is KP Kelly, the Editor-in-Chief at TexasHSFootball.com. On behalf of everyone at Texas HS Football, I wanted to thank you for a tremendous season and for your support of our website and our digital media content. And most importantly, I wanted to thank you for your support of the Texas high school football community and the student athletes. Thank you. I also wanted to take a moment to ask you to join us in thanking our podcast and state championship games sponsor, Jamar Roofing. Jamar Roofing is the original Texas roofers for over 50 years. They offer fair pricing, expert craftsmanship, and local owners who care since 1970. Visit them at jamarroofing.com or call 512-441-8437. Because of great sponsors like JMR Roofing and great fans like you, we're able to provide the content that we do. A big thanks to JMR Roofing, and again, a big thanks to you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and check out TexasHSFootball.com for all things Texas high school football. We'll see you next week.